it is wonderful to be family, mishpacha. It is a blessing. It is a blessing that we are family to our creator maker. And if you remember from last week, there are two reasons why we have our Shabbat that we're to always remember and recall. Our creator God who created all of this for our joy. And the one who, what do we remember? Echo. What echoes? Exodus, yay! It's been a long week, hasn't it? <laughs> but remember we saw the echoes of Exodus all through the scripture. How many times a year we're to remember, remember, recall, recall, and even every Shabbat. So we had to say it because we need to remember it. God wants us to, to reflect on that. And then Bruce brought up with us uh, the Tuba Shabbat. Sh Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to go too fast. I need to slow down. The new year for the trees. And we have just passed through that. It is a, an exciting time to see a new fresh start, to plant a new little sapling, to see it grow. Uh, when I had my first house, the first tree that I planted was a Hana tree. It's an apple tree, but it's not any apple tree. It's Israeli apple. And it grows here well, too, because we're on the same uh, longitude. And so uh, if they were delicious. Um, but uh, there are so many lessons, so many teachings in Scripture about the pets, the tree. So much so that I'm calling this tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> teachings from the trees in the Bible. <laughs> I'm glad you got it. I was afraid I'd be up here with egg on my face. <laughs> Do you know there are over 36 types of trees mentioned in Scripture? And we see the tree right away in the beginning. We see in creation in the first chapter of Genesis, we see the fruitful, the, the fruit trees that are created. And really, other than people, trees are mentioned more than any other of God's creation in Scripture. Mm -hmm. God gave you the, well, you're gonna get there. I'm going to get there, but that's okay. <laughs> I love a student who's excited and wants to go with me. <laughs> God gave trees to all the beasts, to all the birds, to all the creatures that move along the ground, to everything that had breath. God gave trees and related them to to each one. We know that the trees play a pivotal role in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 3, do we not? Two major trees. <clears throat> we know that at the very first Tehillim, the very first song, were to be like the tree planted by the river. When we go into our Brit Chadashah, it doesn't take us long at all. Right there by chapter 3, we're learning about the tree. In this case, the axe is at the root of the tree, ready to cut it off if there isn't some correction. And if we go all the way to the end of the Brit Chadashah, in our very last chapter, when we are seeing the heavenly Yerushalayim, the beauty that will be ours for ever, <laughs> we see the tree of life there, and we see fruit every month a different fruit that uh, it is continually changing. If I take us back from the tree of life being in heaven though, and I take us to the tree of life that we know about in Bereshit in the beginning, we know there were the two trees. I alluded to that a moment ago. We have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we had the tree of life. You know, it's very interesting. <clears throat> Satan came slithering in and drew their attention to if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would be wise. They would be wise like God. But do you know where God said the wisdom was? He said the wisdom was in the other tree. Because Proverbs 3.18 says she, referring to wisdom when you, you read earlier in the chapter, is a tree of life. He was offering wisdom daily, freely, at the tree they would eat continually. They didn't have to go to the other tree to get wisdom. It was right there for them. God had given it all along. 
and we can, as I said, gain much wisdom and learn much from our tremendous study of our trees. We'll see through scripture that uh, many of our major Bible characters are in relation to a tree somewhere in their story. Noah, we'll come back to him. Abraham, we'll come back and I'll explain it. Just see how much you remember as I go through. Moshe, do you know Yosef is even called a tree himself because it says he was a fruitful bough. That was the prophecy over him. Zacchaeus, the blind man who was healed saw me in his trees walking. And Sha'ol Paul, he tells us, basically, if you've taken a walk in the woods, if you've noticed trees, you've noticed the creation of God, and that makes you without excuse for knowing God. If you see all creation, any of creation, it tells you there's a master, a master designer, a master creator, and God even gives us a great illustration of his magnanimous plan for both Jew and Gentile when he brings us to that tree and the grafting in to the tree. The grafting in of the Gentiles into Israel's trunk. And we know that the trunk, the root system, is none other than Yeshua himself and that oneness that we all have in him. The sign and the symbol of existence, of life itself, is seen in the tree. It said, plant a tree, plant hope. Because you don't plant a tree and not expect it to grow, do you? You plant hope. And that tree is a picture of the endurance of life, especially in the longevity of trees. There are other characteristics too, but do you know trees are the oldest living things on this earth? There's one tree, it is said to be, and this was in the year 2020, so we're up to date, that means this year it's going to have a birthday, but as of 2020, this tree is supposed to be, and I don't know how they know, <laughs> but they tell us, 5,070 years old. It is a bristle cone, a new name to me. It's in the White Mountains. And I said, okay, where's the White Mountains National Forest? So I Googled that. That is 800,000 acres. It covers across some of New Hampshire and into Western Maine. So I don't know where, but somewhere in that forest is a 5,000 year old tree. Is that not amazing? And we know the olive tree that we uh, know that even when it's cut off at the, at the stump, that it regrows, that it comes out of it, so that the trees in the uh, garden <clears throat> at Yeshua's time, when we go to that garden area today, we see the stumps that came from that time. How are trees showing us the existence of life? How do we relate? Well, a few points very quickly of what a tree does. Number one, it stays grounded. Good point, isn't it? <laughs> it stays connected to its roots. Every year it turns over a new leaf. It bends before it breaks. And it always keeps growing. I could stop right there and give us, what, five lessons right there? <laughs> just on each one of those. Trees are important for more than just that, too. In our existence, they produce the very oxygen we breathe. They provide food and shelter, shade, rest, protection. They lower the temperatures. They filter water. They hold back erosion. Not to mention the numerous gifts that we get from the tree. Everything from the tires on our cars to the aspirin in our medicine chest. And yes, Bruce, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nation. And where are nations? Where do we read that? In the beginning? No, in Revelation. In the end, in the future that's coming. So trees will be with us forever. Our favorite word. <laughs> in scripture, we see trees used as signposts, especially the fig tree. We see trees used as gathering places. We see images of trees with God's blessing, and we see it also with God's judgment. 
And honestly, if you're looking at, if you're reading about a tree in the story, you can pretty much know how the story goes by how the tree goes. And that's easy to see when you see the fig tree when it was um, cursed. And when you read all the way in Revelation with the pouring out of God's wrath, that a third of the trees are devastated. But yet, remember, trees still speak to us of hope. And remember that olive tree that I mentioned, that you cut it down, but it grows back. Do you know Mark Twain walked through the land of Israel in 1867 and said it was so denuded there was hardly a tree to be found, and he just had nothing good to say about it. That devastation was still there from 70 A.D., when Titus had come in and had just absolutely destroyed all that they could. But as I mentioned, trees grow back, trees planted, and Israel is continually planting. If you took part in our holiday that has just passed, you did get a new tree planted. If you've gone on tour, you may have had the opportunity, as have I more than once, to plant. They water, they take care of that little sapling, and when it is good and strong, but yet young enough to be transplanted, it's picked up, transplanted somewhere throughout Israel. And they keep a record, so you could go to the records and find out where your tree is and go visit it later. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> and we see the olive branch that was brought back, giving such hope to Noah when he was in the ark, waiting for the waters to recede enough that they could come out and go on with life again. And it's very interesting, this has just happened, is cutting news. The olive tree has just won the contest. It is now recognized as Israel's national tree. Wow. It was already, uh, it, the, the national emblem, the menorah, the olive branches, you know, you already see it, but there were a number of trees that they all had to vote on, and the olive tree came out on top. And they say in Israel, the oldest tree that they can find, that they know has not, I'm not talking about the stump, but the tree, is about a thousand years old, and it's found in the, the lower Galilee area. So trees do speak to us, do they not? I think I've probably educated us all more about trees than we had stopped to realize, and we've just begun. It's interesting to note that Abraham, when he moved into the promised land, had left everything behind, didn't know where he was going, wasn't given a map, just God told him, go. And he decided to live among the great trees of Mamre. And don't miss the wanderings in the wilderness also. Do you remember Camp Elim? Camp Elim had 12 springs and 70 palm trees. So, we see later the, the branches of palms, of willows, and of leafy trees are used to build our sukkah. Very good. And did you ever think what Moshe's staff was made out of? It had to have been part of a tree. It had to have been wood. It certainly wasn't man-made. It was something that God had brought to his attention in that way. We even see our beloved Messiah in reference to the tree. I give you Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. And if you ever see the acacia tree, that's a root out of parched ground. Beautiful picture. He was the root of Jesse. And when we hear that in relation to tree, it brings us into a whole new way of thinking, doesn't it? And then remember, he was the son of a carpenter. You think trees were important to his earthly father? <laughs> you think he worked with trees and around trees? And he even likened, likened the kingdom of heaven to a tree. The tree he chose then is an interesting one. It was the mustard seed. Mustard seed, when it's planted, is the tiniest among seeds. It literally looks like a speck of sand. It does not look like the pod that you see the, when you see jewelry or something featuring a mustard seed. If you can see it well, that's a pod. And in that pod are 600 to 800 seeds. It is like a, just a speck 
of dust. I forgot to bring mine tonight. I'll show you next time. I'll bring it anyway. Uh, but that mustard seed, when it's planted, becomes one of the largest trees. It at first grows like a bush. And I've seen the mustard seed bush in Israel. In fact, that's where I got my mustard seed from. But then it grows and becomes such a tree that scripture says the birds nest in it. Interesting, isn't it? That's Matthew 13 and that's Luke 13 also that talks about the mustard seed. He taught, Yeshua taught about the fig tree. We know that. He called some of his Talmudi from under the trees. I think they were in the shade resting from the hot sun. And he called some of the sinners down from the branches of the trees. I named one for you a bit ago, Zacchaeus. If you drive into the area that's in Samaria now, so we usually do not go on our tours, but if you do drive into that area, they'll be glad to even show you the sycamore tree that he <laughs> came down out of. <laughs> for what that's worth. <laughs> but also we see in Yeshua's life, we see palm branches that were put down on his path, waved before him, honoring him, even though he was riding in lowly on a donkey. They were showing him, crying out, Hoshana, Yeshua saves. And yet, a week later, he dies on a tree. A whole nother way of looking at a tree. We're looking at the way a tree brings life. And this tree brought life because his death brought abundant life, resurrection life powerful life. This tree is the greatest tree, the tremendous tree for what it teaches us and brings to us. You know, when we look at Tehillim 22, Psalm 22, we get a description of what happened on that tree. It is a picture of crucifixion so clear, no one argues it, and yet crucifixion wasn't even a mode of capital punishment for 700 more years. But I bring you to that chapter for a very special reason in relation to the tree. And I love this. It is so amazing. If you have not heard it before, hang on. I'm taking you to verse 6. In the midst of this description, and, and I think this had to have confounded the wise, the quote is given. Now remember, this is being a picture of, foretelling what will happen to Messiah. But here's what verse 6 says. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. How on earth do we see Yeshua as a worm? And how does that relate to a tree today? Well, let me tell you about that Hebrew word. That Hebrew word is tola. Ought. It's a Hebrew word that means crimson or scarlet worm. It's not the usual generic word for worm, which is rima. This is a different word, and it's all in relation to that crimson or scarlet worm. I could give you the scientific name. I can't even pronounce it, but Coccus elysis, I don't know. Anyway, it's more like a grub than a worm, and here's why it is so amazing and so fascinating. When it's time for the female to have her babies, and she only does this once in her lifetime, she finds a tree trunk. Now, she can find other wood today, but originally, she finds a tree trunk. She attaches her body to that wooden tree trunk, and she makes a hard crimson shell. She is so strongly, so permanently stuck to that tree trunk that she can never be removed without it tearing her body apart and killing her. She lays her eggs while she's attached to that tree under her body so that her protective shell protects her babies. And when those babies hatch, her body not only is their protection, but literally provides them with food. The babies feed on the living body of the mother. After a few days, the babies are able to take care of themselves, and the mother dies. She spent out her life 
bringing life to her babies. As Mama Crimson Worm dies, she oozes a crimson, scarlet, red dye that stains the trunk, the wood that she's attached to, and it also stains her young babies. They are now colored scarlet red, like she was, and they will be that color the rest of their lives. I'm not done. After three days, the dead mother crimson worm's body loses its crimson color, turns into a white wax that falls to the ground like a snowflake. And that white wax has medicinal properties in it that help the heart beat smoothly. There are other properties too, but that one in particular shocked me. It's also used to produce a shellac that's a preservative for wood. But do you not see the picture I see? Is that not why our Messiah, our Savior said, I am a worm? Because he gave birth to us. His blood stained us that we have his blood over us, protecting us, saving us. Yeshia, Isaiah 1, 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Remember the end? Though they be red like crimson, they will be as wool. And our spiritual heart beats, comes alive and beats smoothly when we feed off of him. What a picture in the toll lot on the tree truck. Amazing. This one who took this curse upon himself, and it is called a curse in Davarim, Deuteronomy 21 and verse 23, and even the Berchad Shah talks about anyone who hangs on the tree is cursed. Galatians 3.13 this one took the curse on himself to redeem mankind. He's the one that gives us that resurrection power. Mama took the curse on herself. She brought life to her babies through her death. And then what results is that pure white that's medicinal. That is where the story goes on. That is where we see the tree living on. That's where we see the newness of life. That is our almighty God. There are many things that happen in this parsha. It is one of the richest, I think. There are so many lessons we can draw from this parsha. There are so many other things I could have talked about. Many names given, we even see, we're introduced to Adonai, um, to Nisi, Yehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner, the banner that's raised up. I'll bring that out again in just a bit and tell you where. But right now what I want to say is even though we see other names in our scripture, I think this parasha shows us El Shaddai better than any other area. And I'll tell you why as we go on. The name El Shaddai is used 41 times in scripture. It's not that it's here, but it's in scripture. The derivation or the origin of it really is unknown. So we take that and we break it down to its Hebrew roots and to the words that we see out of that. It probably is the best compound name known of God, the compound name being El with another name put with it. But here's the breakdown. When you hear El Shaddai, if we take just the die out of Shaddai, in Hebrew that means sheds forth or pours out to heap benefits. All of that suggests provision, sustenance, blessing, just by the word die. The word shad or shadaim is breast or breasts when it's plural, it's the im on the end. And that brings us the picture of one who nourishes supplies, satisfies. Now combine that with El, the name for God, and you have the one who is mighty to nourish, to satisfy, and to supply. Shaddad, in our Hebrew, the root of Shaddad, 
means to overpower or to destroy. And when it's talking about a person, it's calling that person the overpowerer, that he is the one who overpowers. This suggests absolute power. This would be the God who compels nature to do what's contrary to itself. What do I see of that in our parasha? The splitting of the Red Sea. That was not natural. They were able to triumph over the obstacle of the Red Sea because the one who is almighty, El Shaddai, has power over nature even. He can subdue all things to himself. And that's what this name is meaning. And if we go back into the Akkadian, which is the, the uh, ancient, going back even further, the word is shadu. It means mountain. And it's bringing out the picture of great strength. So we put this all together with our Jehovah God. And we have the one who mightily nourishes, satisfies, protects, supplies, the all-sufficient sustainer who abundantly blesses with all manner of blessings. One who is all-powerful, for only one who is all-powerful could be all-sufficient and all-bountiful. What an amazing God. What an amazing name. That's just El Shaddai. And that's just the little bit we know because I'm sure God's up there chuckling and saying, well, girl, you're, you're started, but I got a lot more to show you. <laughs> but it perfectly describes our God in action in our parasha this week, which I said is chock full because we see God over nature. We see the cloud. This cloud is used by day to protect them from the heat of the sun in the wilderness wanderings. It's the pillar of fire by night to keep them warm. And when they needed it, when they had the Egyptian army behind them and the Red Sea in front of them, the cloud split in both forms, not just one. The cloud went behind them and blocked the view of the Egyptians from seeing the Israelis, and the pillar of fire went before them to lead them in the light that they needed to see, to see the path that God had made at least five miles wide that the children of Israel could get through that night. That is an amazing, all-powerful El Shaddai. He parts that Red Sea. He gets them across on dry ground. He lifts his cloud. The Egyptians see it. There they go, and they take off after them. And the amazing thing is, not one Israeli got one foot stuck in mud, didn't get one wheel stuck in mud. They went across on dry ground, and suddenly the Egyptians are stuck. And they can't get out of what they're stuck in. Their chariot wheels are bogged down and their feet are bogged down. And the waters come crashing down. The God of nature has done his powerful act of salvation. Who is like unto our God? That's in our parasha to this. No, Exodus 15 and verse 11. Who is like you among the gods? Oh, Lord. Misha Maha Baalim Yehovah. That's the battle cry of the Maccabees. That's Misha Maha Baalim Yehovah. Who? Me is who? Yes. Yes. Who is like you among the gods? Oh, Lord. That's what it is in our English, that's in our Hebrew, that's that battle cry lifting up the banner, Yehovah Nissi. The battle cry that gained the Maccabean victory, the battle cry that we see gain victory time and again. The walls of Jericho fall down. That wasn't nature, they fell the wrong way. They fell in on the people instead of falling out on the Israelis. God is awesome. God is amazing. God is all-powerful. But in this parasha, he not only has split the Red Sea, drowned the Egyptian army, 
They get a little bit into the distance, into the wilderness, and they start their complaining. We're so thirsty. We're going to die of thirst. And what does God do? Brings water out of a rock. Now, grant you, this is not a little pebble. This is a huge rock because it's going to water two and a half million plus people. But what do we know about the rock in Scripture? And if you follow the rock all the way through, you find the rock of our salvation. And that's none other than Yeshua. That's none other than El Shaddai, the one who is providing. He not only provided for their thirst, but the next thing you know is their tummies are growling. And when they start growling, they go, the, the, the tummies started growling, the mouth started growling also. And they started complaining about that. You brought us out here to die. Like a and yet what does God do? Brings down the bread of life for them. Brings down bread, man, mana, whatever you call it, so that they were satiated, had all they needed every single day. We know that's a picture of the bread of life. And when you feed on the bread of life every day, your tummy doesn't growl. You don't go hungry. And guess what? You have every nutrient you need. God satisfies, fulfills, and gives you what you need. He's the living water. He's the bread of life. He's El Shaddai. Wow. Who is like you, oh Lord our God? There is none that are like him. And what spills out in Shemot 15, Thomas, I don't know, it's song. They're singing. They can't contain it. It just bursts out. It's known as the song of Moses, the song of victory, horse and rider thrown into the sea. And it, Bruce read out earlier the song of Deborah from our Hoftor portion, also in this, in victory with Barak. And Barak, he knew Deborah had wisdom from God, the prophet, prophetess who saw from God. And it wouldn't even go into battle without her. And yet, we, we remember. We remember this victory in song. Remember the echoes of the Exodus? Don't songs echo in our heart too? And I'm not done. We're going to see more song before I get to the end. We see the victory for Devorah and Barak also. Provision satisfaction, the spontaneous song of Moshe. Let me take you to Tehillim, to Psalm 21 and verse 13. It says, I will sing. Well, it actually says we. Okay, I personalized it, sorry. It says, let me give you the whole verse. Be exalted, Adonai, in your strength. We will sing and praise your are you singing to your God? Are you singing and exalting El Shaddai? He wants to hear our song. We can follow it all the way through scripture too. In Yeshaya, our prophets, we find chapter 12 and verse 2. Behold, hello, pay attention. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Can you hear it? Can you clap and say, if I could sing, I'd break out. I, could, I make a joyful noise. Thomas sings. <laughs> now let me take you all the way to the end again, because all the way through scripture, start noticing sing, sing, sing. And by the way, God doesn't care if you make a joyful noise instead of if you can carry the tune. He's just happy to hear your song. Revelation 15, 3 says, They sang the song of Moshe, Echo, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. What's the song saying? Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Guess what? That's El Shaddai. That's how it's translated the most, is God Almighty. So when we are singing and saying great and marvelous 
are your works, O Lord God. And that's another song I hear in my mind. We are singing El Shaddai. What an awesome, amazing God we have. There is so much in this parasha. I encourage you, meditate on it. Think on it day and night. Be like a tree. A tree seeks water. It puts its roots down deep. If it's well watered, the roots go down. When you see trees, I mean, roots close to the surface, it's because it's hungry for water. It's starving for water. It's looking for it wherever it can find it. But a healthy tree has roots that go down deep. That is drinking water daily. We need to put our roots down. Actually, what we need to do is tap into the root, the root being Yeshua, and he being the living water, him being the El Shaddai that satisfies and, and gives us all we need. That's the type of tree we need to be so that we can be like the psalmist described in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Their delight is in Adonai's Torah. On his Torah they meditate day and night, and they are like trees planted by streams. They bear their fruit in season, and their leaves never wither. Everything they do succeeds. Do you want success in everything you do? Put your roots down in his water and be like that tree. Don't miss the forest for the trees and don't miss the trees for the forest. Don't go barking up a wrong tree. There is no other God. There is nothing else to help. There is nothing else that satisfies. I can take you again all the way back to the garden and remind you, look what happened when they barked up the wrong tree. If you're down in the dumps, why are you not looking at Danielle's deliverer? The deliverer who brought Danielle through the lion's den, who brought his three compatriots through a fiery furnace, who brought the children of Israel through captivity and back into their land. In this parish alone, our El Shaddai has delivered them from slavery, from the sea, from thirst, from hunger. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord my God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. There are so many contrasts in here, too, that we need to see in this. We see that, that we are given a willingness to choose, but we need to decide to surrender. We see that we are totally responsible for ourselves, but we are absolutely unable to help ourselves. Do we want our own freedom, or do we want God's sovereignty? His sufficiency tells us that we are insufficient, but he gives us everything we need. That tree doesn't go wanting. It has everything it needs. So when we are down in the dumps and in despair, we need to look for our deliverance instead. And we do need to choose how we look at our circumstances because we have plans, we have hopes, we have desires. Sometimes we get these things and sometimes we get them, but mm, not quite the way we imagined. And our response will tell us whether we are in tune with our God and rejoicing in deliverance or whether we are despairing. We need to see it from his view because Yeshua Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 tells us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I think, thank you, God, because if you think on my little peon level and in my little abilities, which are inabilities, where would I be? The three trees. Once there were three trees on a hill in the woods, they were discussing their hopes and dreams when the first tree said, someday I hope to be a treasure chest. 
I could be filled with gold and silver and precious gems. I could be decorated with intricate carvings and everyone would see the beauty. Then the second tree said, Someday I will be a mighty ship. I will take kings and queens across the waters and sail to the corners of the world. Everyone will feel safe in me because of the strength of my hull. Finally, the third tree said, I want to grow to be the tallest and the straightest tree in the forest. People will see me on top of the hill and look up to my branches and think of the heavens and God and how close to them I am reaching. Sorry, how close to him I'm reaching. I will be the greatest tree of all time and people will always remember me. Well, after a few years of praying that their dreams would come true, a group of woodsmen came upon the trees. When one came to the first tree, he said, this looks like a strong tree. I think I should be able to sell the wood to a carpenter. And he began cutting it down. The tree was happy because he knew that carpenter would make him into a treasure chest. At the second tree, the woodsman said, this looks like a strong tree. I should be able to sell it to the shipyard. And the second tree was happy because he was on his way to becoming a mighty ship. When the woodsman came to the third tree, the tree was frightened because he knew that if they cut him down, his dreams would not come true. And one of the woodsmen said, I don't need anything special for my tree. I'll take this one. And he cut it down. When the first tree arrived at the carpenters, he was made into a feed box for animals. And then he was placed in a barn and filled with hay. Far cry from his dream. That was not at all what he prayed for. The second tree was cut, that was cut down was made into a very small fishing boat. His dreams of being a mighty ship and carrying kings had come to an end. And the third tree was cut into large pieces and left alone in the dark. The years went by and the trees forgot about their dreams. Then one day a man and a woman came to the barn. She gave birth, and they placed the baby in the hay in the feed box that was made from the first tree. The man wished that he could have been made a crib for the baby, but this manger would have to do. The tree could feel the importance of this event and knew that it held the greatest treasure of all time. Years later, a group of men got into a fishing boat, that fishing boat made from that second tree. One of them was tired and went to sleep. And while they were out on the water, a great storm arose and the tree didn't think it was strong enough to keep the men safe. The men woke up the sleeping man and he stood and he said, Shalom. And the storm stopped. At this time, the tree knew that it carried the king of kings in his boat. Finally, someone came and got that third tree. It was carried through the streets as the people mocked the man who was carrying it. When they came to a stop, the man was nailed to the tree and raised in the air to die at the top of a hill. When Sunday came, the tree came to realize it was strong enough to stand at the top of the hill and be as close to God as, as was possible because Jesus had been crucified on it. The three trees got their wishes, not in the way they thought, but the way God knew was best. Sometimes God gives us desires and we don't understand and we look for fulfillment our way. But remember, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts than our thoughts. In 1 Chronicles 16, 33, the first part of the verse says, Then the trees of the forest will sing for joy before Adonai, the Lord. We need to grow like those trees. We need to grow toward the light, put our roots down deep. We need to have green leaf in COVID time. Oops, that isn't what the psalmist said. He said green leaf in drought time. But does not the word COVID fit? Or whatever other valley trial that you're going through. How are you to have green leaf in a time of severe hurt or sorrow or lacking? 
is by looking to El Shaddai and realizing he will supply all you need according to all his riches in glory. He has everything. He created everything. How can you lack? Is it not tremendous teachings from the trees? Do we not see what lessons we can learn from the trees? It is amazing what God has put around us. The next time you want to be discouraged, instead of having that look of, of joy and deliverance, look at a tree and see what you can learn so that we can be tremendous servants for our God who supplies all our need. El Shaddai.